thought I was done documenting the vegetation at Fittiment Field, but there's one more chapter to add because today I was out and I saw a whole bunch of city trucks out there and it's like, oh man, what disastrous BS are they up to now? And I actually ran into someone who is in charge, one of the higher ups. He is an urban forester and has a master's in environmental science. Not that that always means they know what they're doing, but in any case, he was kind enough to talk to me and talk to me thoroughly. So before I forget that conversation, let me share what I learned. They were planting more trees and putting up the cones around the trees to protect them. And I asked him if I could talk to him and he said, sure. And I said, so at what point are they going to reseed the vegetation that grows around the trees? Is there any plan for that? To which he said, well, that's a tough one because of all of the rules, all of the regulations, and the native plant seeds are so expensive. Of course, he said, you know, they do goat grazing in order to help the native plants come back. And I stopped him and I said, I don't want to be rude, but I've been watching this and it is not helping the native plants come back. And if I may ask you, how does unleashing goats cause native plants to come back? Like, he actually said, well, if I had my way, we would do prescribed burns and then reseed once we actually burned out these invasives, which is exactly the conclusion that I came to after observing this situation for multiple years, because it is just a banging our heads against the wall, endless cycle of mowing and grazing, mowing and grazing, and invasive plants coming back every time. How, at the end of that, are native plants supposed to magically reappear? This gets pretty interesting because he said the biggest obstacle are the regulations set forth by California Fish and Wildlife. And I said, you can't get permission to do a prescribed burn and reseed with native plants, but you can unleash livestock? No problem? He said, yeah. Now, I'm not a fan of fish and wildlife departments, who were until very recently known as fish and game, which really reveals their mentality toward nature. They view it as game. They view it as recreation. They view it as here just for us to use and kill, but not kill off to the point to where we don't have any left to kill in the future. And I'll quickly touch on how this applies to another project I'm working on, Point Reyes National Seashore, where one of the biggest obstacles for relocating the endemic tule elk of California to other locations or helping the ones that are dying in Point Reyes National Seashore because of agriculture, the obstacle is California Fish and Wildlife and all their regulations and they're claiming to be careful about not spreading diseases and whatnot, but of course any diseases that the poor elk have contracted come as a result of the animal agriculture that they are surrounded by. They would rather just say no to helping a native animal than finding a solution to helping a native animal, even when wealthy landowners are available to host those animals on their property. But back to this particular story. Any of you who are interested in the long history of these fields that I've been documented, I've actually been posting these. You can see them on YouTube and here on Instagram. And they're not entertaining. They are thorough video documentation of the plants and what plants grow and what the results are after mowing and after grazing. If you're so inclined, feel free to go through those videos. They are all contained within this playlist. I just haven't really promoted them because they aren't entertainment value. They are long explanations and observations and trying to understand what's happening as I observe these situations, which basically consists of identifying plants and seeing which ones are growing at what time of year. And if there is any progress with native plants recovering whatsoever by actually watching what's happening, not claiming that unleashing livestock on land is going to somehow magically cause native plants to come back, which is absolutely ridiculous 
ridiculous. But I actually thoroughly filmed and documented what happens in these spots. And I did it multiple times per month over long periods of time. This past year, I made a very specific effort to note the date and time. And if you go into my archival footage, which is also in the playlist, this goes all the way back to 2018. The most recent video, the video before this one, I said that I came full circle from the mowing cycle, the edging, and the goat grazing to when all that happens again and that the end result is just invasive plants. Again, we just beat our heads against the wall. We throw human power, we throw resources, we throw time, we throw money at it, and we don't ever accomplish an end goal, which is why I asked this person I ran in today, why not just do it correctly? And his answer was, they are stopped by regulations. I took this a step further. I said, theoretically speaking, in a fantastical world where money wasn't a problem, you had all the funds that you need to properly reseed native plants, would California Fish and Wildlife still be an obstacle? He said yes. So, we, the foolish masses, applaud when we see goats and we applaud when we see mowing because it's people doing their due diligence, doing their work, trying to manage vegetation. When in fact, what we're doing is burning taxpayer money and hurting the environment. A species specific note really quick. Throughout those videos, I kept asking myself, when is the yellow star thistle going to come back? When is the yellow star thistle going to come back? Because it was absolutely dominating those fields for a while. And I conceded a little bit. I was like, wait a minute, did I actually see somewhat of a positive here? Because I didn't see the yellow star thistle come back. Now, that doesn't mean that native plants came back. Instead, it was a replacement of the yellow star thistle with other invasive non-native plants. But yellow star thistle is pretty nasty, so I was ready to say, well, maybe that's kind of a positive. But today, I saw that the yellow star thistle is still there. I don't know if it has some sort of crazy strategy, but it is waiting until late in the year, May 19th, before it decided to start sprouting. All these other invasive plants, like I must have documented 20 species of different invasives throughout all these fields in this town. And until May 19th, when all the other ones are dying off or got mowed down, here comes the yellow star thistle. It shows you the hardiness of that plant, that it is going to grow during the heat of the summer. And it's not alone. The broadleaf fillery, which just really dominated things this year, but according to my last video, was finally getting dry and uh, dying off. Well, no, today I saw that there's just a whole new generation of them green and growing right now alongside the ones that already died. Point being that you never ever win this battle by mowing or grazing. These are invasive plants that don't give a crap what time of year it is. If you drop their seeds on the ground and you disturb that soil, they're gonna keep coming. They're just gonna come with multi-tiered generations, which doubles the fact that you can't accomplish your goal. Now, I hadn't seen the goats in a while, so I asked this gentleman, I said, has the city moved away from goat grazing? And he said, no, the budget just isn't allowing for it, which tells you how expensive it is to bring in these goats. Now, this gentleman kept tolerating my questions, so I kept asking them, and kudos to him for that. And he explained to me how it's supposed to work, and I said, I'm sorry, that's not what's happening. And he mentioned that uh, tree cover is supposed to help um, eliminate the invasive plants. And I said, well, if that's the case, then why did they unleash the goats down in the creek under the tree cover before they unleash them in these fields? And he said, well, that's not supposed to happen. There's supposed to be someone here observing this. There's supposed to be a goat herder on hand 24-7 and the dogs. And I was like, well, 
there's someone here, but he's sitting in his trailer, and I don't think the dogs are going to report to you um, on the invasive plant species very well. He also conceded to me that a problem with unleashing the goats in those areas is that the goats are going to target the saplings, the native plants that are supposed to be recovering, the ones that are budding. And I said, yeah, it's on camera. That's exactly what happens. The first thing they eat are the green, new, desirable plants. The last thing they eat are the invasive plants. Again, it's hard for me not to see the relationship with fish and wildlife, and animal agriculture. When I see that they are unwilling to do things correctly, they are unwilling to allow programs that will do things correctly and actually return native habitat, but they are happy to do an endless cycle of unleashing livestock, which does not help and costs people money, but benefits animal agriculture and the trend taking place across our public lands for fish and wildlife to promote the killing of native animals on behalf of animal agriculture. Just because there's an organization with a title that you recognize does not mean that those people know what they're doing or are doing what is best. For the environment. Anyway, I wanted to share it today with you because it's the first time that I got someone in a position of authority to concede with some of my observations. And I'm in school again studying ecology, and I'll get to this in a different video, but I'll give you a little taste. Two of my professors in their coursework had material that indicated that grazing was one of the factors in destroying California's native plant habitat. But later on in the same semester, they included using grazing as a habitat restoration method. And I challenged them on this, which of course professors tend to not like. And I simply said, all I want is a physical example. I don't want an article. I want a physical example that you personally are familiar with in which this was successful in restoring habitat, which they couldn't provide. So again, just because someone is in a position of power or influence does not mean that they know what they're talking about. What better example than our National Park Service, especially here in Point Reyes National Seashore, who defy science and everything that I've learned in ecology with every breath of their mouth in their desperate attempt to defend animal action.